Okay, great. Good evening, everyone, and welcome again uh, to our third session in the summer series organized by the Orthodox Fellowship of St. John the Baptist, entitled Through the Prayers of Our Holy Fathers and Mothers. My name is Margaret Haig, and I'm the current chair of the fellowship. The fellowship brings together Orthodox Christians from the different jurisdictions in the British Isles and Ireland through talks, pilgrimages, conferences and youth festivals. And if you'd like to join the fellowship um, and uh, receive our membership um, publication forerunner and receive other information about the um, fellowship events um, er with early um, advance warning, then please do look at our website. There's a joining form on there. Next year, we'll be organizing an in-person conference and we would like you to save the date. It will be at the end of August, the 25th to the 29th of August, 2022 and will be held in the beautiful and holy place of Walsingham in Norfolk. We're excited to announce that we will be joined by Father Stephen de Young, author of The Religion of the Apostles and co-host of the Lord of, Spirit, Lord of All Spirits podcast on Ancient Faith Radio. The working title of the conference is Angelic Beings, and we hope to open applications in September. So look out for that, please. We're pleased to offer these sessions for free. However, we do welcome donations to the fellowship, which we will use to help reduce the cost of the 2022 conference so that more people can attend. I've put the link for that in the chat. So if you're able to make a small donation, um, then that would be very welcome. If you're not able to use PayPal, do just send us an email and we'll send you the bank details so you can make a bank transfer as an alternative. This summer series focuses on some of the important saints and witnesses of the 20th century. We've heard already about Father Nikolai Steinhardt, St. Siloan and St. Sophroni, and future sessions will be on Metropolitan Antony of Soros, Father Alexander Men, and St. Porphyrios and Mother Gavrilia. This evening, we welcome Subdeacon Ian Randall to speak to us about St. Maria Skobtseva of Paris. Subdeacon Ian first heard of orthodoxy in his teens as an Anglican, when a priest told him that the Orthodox do some things better than we do. He joined the Fellowship of St Alban and St Sergius and often attended the liturgy at the Orthodox Church on Canterbury Road in Oxford, also keeping in touch with Orthodoxy through the Monastery of St John the Baptist in Tolishant Nights. He was received into the Orthodox Church on his retirement in 2005. At the end of the presentation, there will be the opportunity for you to ask questions. Please do type these into the chat and we will address as many as we can uh, within the restraints of time that we have. So please make sure you add them and you can do that as you go along. Um, for those who are new to Zoom, then the main um, place to look for chat is at the bottom of your screen. If you're on a laptop or computer, there's a speech bubble that says chat, click on that and you can type in your message. And if you're on a smartphone or tablet, you may need to either tap your screen to access the chat or swipe your screen um, to find it. So uh, make sure you know how to do that so that you can pose your questions. And as I said, you can do that as we go along, um, but if you find the chat messages distracting as they are posted, you can turn that functionality off that um, the notifications of new chat messages. Right, uh, I um, think that's everything I needed to say to people. I um, Hopefully you already have the presentation on your screen. You may wish to specifically select speaker view so that you have the full screen experience. Um, but if um, otherwise, just have it how it uh, works best for you. I'm going to ask uh, Subdeacon Ian to begin his presentation now. So hopefully he can um, unmute himself. I'm going to just click the button, hopefully that will appear for him. Yes, wonderful. Subdeacon Ian, Hi I think you're there. Yes, I can hear you clearly, thank you. So um, I think you're going to start um, with a prayer and then begin your presentation on St. Maria. Thank you. Right. O heavenly King, comfort us, spirit of truth, who art everywhere present and fillest all things, treasure of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us. Cleanse us from all impurity, and of thy goodness, save our souls. We rightly praise as witnesses to truth and preachers of, of piety. Dimitri, Mary, George, and Ellie, 
who supported imprisonments, sufferings, and unjust judgment, and by their martyrdom have received an unfading crown. Right. Like many others, I first came to know about Mother Maria through the works of Father Sergei Hackel, Memory Eternal. Firstly, his biography, One of Great Price, published in 1965, and then the revised edition entitled Pearl of Great Price in 1982. Then a few years later, quite a lot of years later actually, the saint drew me to herself in various ways. So Elizabeth Pilenko, the future Mother Maria, had an entry into the world and to the church in 1891, and both were difficult. She was born by an emergency caesarean section and had to be resuscitated after her, her immersion in the font. Her father was a public prosecutor in St. Petersburg, but while Elizabeth was still a small child, he inherited the family estates at Annaba. The family moved there, and she enjoyed a happy childhood on the coast of the Black Sea, loving the sea and the surrounding countryside. She developed an interest in archaeology and a love for poetry. As well as continuing to develop the estate and improving the quality of the wine he produced, her father contributed to the development of Annapa, providing street lighting and an hospital. This beneficence may have uh, influenced Elizabeth's future. Winters were spent in St. Petersburg, where her great aunt was a notable figure. She held a salon which was famous for its mixture of nobles, scruffy students and state officials. All were treated alike. It was only an Arivist who spoke differently and behaved differently to those that they saw as above or below them. This was the principle which Elizabeth quickly absorbed. One of her aunt's close friends and a near neighbor was Konstantin Petrovich Pobeda Onostev, the procurator of the Holy Synod, former tutor to two czars and an arch reactionary. Elizabeth became a firm favorite of his and she looked upon him as a friend and gave him that title in an article published in 1925. When she was 12, she asked the old man, what is truth? And he answered, love of someone far away is not love. If, if everyone loved their neighbor, the one who is here now beside you, there would be no need of love the one who is far off. At the time, this answer did not satisfy her, but it must have sunk deep into her soul. Can everybody see that clearly? I can't, there's pictures yeah. in the way. Yes, we can see it. Right, good. 1905 was a year of change. It brought humiliating defeat for Russia in war with Japan, it saw an attempted revolution, and it found the Pilanko family on the move. Elizabeth's father was appointed head of the Imperial School of Viticulture at Yalta. This was a place of new ideas for her. The students were full of revolutionary ideals, readers of revolutionary literature. The 14-year-old girl found herself torn between her regard for Pobodinostsev the arch villain, as far as the students were concerned, and love for the Russian people. The scales tipped, and when she heard of an impending police search of the school in her father's absence, she telephoned a warning. When the searchers arrived, they found a revol no revolutionary material, but some very hot stoves. The next year brought greater change, Elizabeth's father died. She decided that this was unjust. Therefore, there is not a just God. Therefore, there is no God. 
Together with her mother and younger brother, she moved back to live in St. Petersburg permanently. There she continued her education. Uh, she was expelled from the first school she joined for the crime of writing another pupil's essays for her. She enrolled in a teacher training school and for a little while was teaching evening classes for workers. She also enrolled in the Theological Academy, allowed to follow the courses, but as a woman, not admitted to the lectures. She was also developing as an artist and embroiderer. Her work at this period of her life shows an interest in Hinduism, but it is not clear if this was solely aesthetic or from a spiritual interest as it was for the future St. Sophrone. Not surprisingly, after her experience at Yalta, Elizabeth moved in a circle where literature and left-wing politics combined. At the age of 18, she married a member of Lenin's Social Democrat Party, Dmitry Kuzmin Karabayev. This she did partly out of pity, hoping to save him, the mistake too many young women have made in the course of history. One of his problems was excessive drinking. Yet there may have been something operating at a deeper level. She was being drawn to the suffering Christ, still not believing in God, but through Christ to suffering outcasts. During the uneasy period leading up to 1917, she was part of a group that included Akmatova, Mandelstam and Bloch. Her own first volume of poems was produced. Her marriage was under strain, and in 1912, they spent a period apart, and she formed a relationship with a man whose name we do not know, but whom a friend described as a simple and straightforward man. It is not, not unlikely that he was the father of her daughter, Guyana. Someone has speculated that Elizabeth's choice of name for her daughter is connected to earth mysticism, a cult of, of Gaia, but there is a Saint Guyana, an Armenian martyr, so the speculation seems unnecessary. Whoever was Guyana's father, the marriage to Kuzmin Karavayev was ended by divorce. Later, he reappears in the story. He became a priest in the Society of Jesus and was, was able to make arrangements for Guyana's education at a convent school. Perhaps Elizabeth had contributed to saving him. Among the political and literary friendships of this time, that with Alexander Bloch was particularly close. They spent many hours in conversation, lamenting the ineffectiveness of left-wing intellectual debates. On a positive note, they were both students of the work of Vladimir Solovyov. His influence, or perhaps a agreement with him, can be seen in the life of the future Mother Maria. In 1918, the family, Elizabeth, her mother, her brother, and the child Guyana, moved back to Anapa and the family estate. Very soon, she became a member of the local council and deputy mayor. Can we see here the influence of her father's benefactions at work? The mayor resigned and she found herself acting mayor. This was a difficult position. On the one hand, she was dealing with the day-to-day -day concerns of the people, the granting of this or that permission, and also dealing with an influx of people displaced by the revolution and the civil war. On the other hand, she was dealing with the Bolshevik Revolutionary Committee, which considered itself to be the real source of power. She, to them, she was suspect as a landowner and as an SR, a member of the Socialist Revolutionary Party. Yet as a woman mayor, she was revolutionary. She stood out against the Bolsheviks 
in securing cash payments of the allowance for wives of serving soldiers, not payment in the paper money, which the women did not trust. She did this by organizing a demonstration by the women outside the Bolshevik offices. More dramatically, and with greater potential for disaster, she stood out against the crew of a ship from the Black Sea Fleet. They arrived at Anapa, demanding a large sum of money as a ransom for the town and had a list of people to whom they wished to give a bath. Amazed at what they thought was, in their own words, just a bird, they, she turned out to be an Amazon, telling them that they would not get a penny or a person, and they left, though they did kidnap, kidnap two men whom they drowned at sea. The Civil War reached Anapa, and the town fell to the advancing White Army. There were arrests and summary executions. As mayor under the Bolsheviks, Elizabeth was automatically suspect. She was accused of collaboration and in particular of confiscating the sanatoria which belonged to her predecessor as mayor, which the council had indeed taken over as hospitals. Her defense was that the prosecution evidence gave her a role which she could not possibly have played. Second, the testimonies of many citizens to the good she had done. And thirdly, that as an SR, she was pledged not to assist the Bolsheviks. In fact, not many months before, she had taken part in the Eighth Party Congress in Moscow. She was found guilty and sentenced to two weeks imprisonment and then given an amnesty. In her own account, there is no mention of Daniel Skopsov. One account has him as the judge shredding the prosecution case. Father Segai says that he made an unexpected intervention of some unspecified kind. I think we should be content with that. Not long after, Elizabeth married Daniel whom photographs show to have been extremely handsome, even in old age. The Red Army gained the upper hand and the White Army was pushed back and totally defeated. In 1920, Elizabeth with her mother and Guyana escaped to Georgia. There she gave birth to her son, Yuri. Since the group icons of the parish martyrs label him as not with the Slavonic form of his name, but with the Western form, George, I will use that name. The family moved on to Constantinople, where Daniel rejoined them. They moved again with the aid of Nansen passports to Belgrade, where another daughter, Anastasia, was born. Again they moved reaching their final destination, Paris, in 1923. Circumstances were hard. Elizabeth earned a little through her needlework, causing further deterioration to her already poor eyesight. Eventually, Daniel gained work as a taxi driver. Then four-year-old Anastasia fell ill, first with flu and finally with meningitis. She was admitted to hospital and Elizabeth cared for her, staying by her bedside for about two months. During this time, she made a series of sketches of Anastasia, three of them on the day of her death. If the one in the printed sources is a fair sample, they were strikingly beautiful. Anastasia's death marked a turning point in her mother's life. She wrote at the time, for years I did not know, in fact, I never knew the meaning of repentance, but now I am aghast at my own insignificance. At Nastia's side, I felt that my soul had wandered down back alleys all my life. And now I want an authentic and a purified road, not out of faith in life, but in order to justify 
understand and accept death. No amount of thought will ever result in any greater formulation than these words, love one another, so long as it is to the end and without exception. We have seen that in the St. Petersburg days, she had been drawn to the suffering Christ. In 1914, she had taken on the mysticism, uh, sorry, asceticism, of wearing a heavy lead weight under her clothing and began reading the Manion. She now returned wholeheartedly to the church. A few years later, Anastasia's remains were exhumed and reburied in a more seemly grave. Her mother had to be present and afterwards she had a new awareness of a new and special proud and all embracing motherhood, sorry, broad and all embracing motherhood. I returned from that cemetery a different person. I saw a new road before me and a new meaning in life to be a mother for all, for all who need material care, assistance, or protection. Anastasia's death and tensions over Guyana led to the breakup of the marriage to Daniel. He left, taking George with him. Although there was an ecclesiastical divorce, there was never a civil divorce. Friendship seems to have persisted, and in later years, Elizabeth, by then Mother Maria, used to visit her ex husband for days of rest at a small holding outside Paris that he was looking after for a Jewish family. George particularly enjoyed these family times together. As Mother Maria emptied her baggage of complaints about individuals or the general situation, the men would exaggerate the awfulness of those about whom she spoke until she burst out laughing and all cares were forgotten. That was in the future. After her daughter's death, Elizabeth began to work as a traveling secretary for ACER, the Christian Action for Russian Students, kind of SCM. The general secretary was Nicholas Zernoff, who went on to do so much to spread knowledge of orthodoxy in Britain. Russian students was a term given a liberal interpretation, just as in orthodox circles, if you are single and under 35, you are youth. So in the emigration, if you were Russian and single, you were a student. Theoretically, Elizabeth's job was to provide spiritual aid through literature and lectures. Reality was rather different. When she arrived on a visit to mines in the Pyrenees, one man said to her, we don't want lectures, we want someone to clean the floor. Elizabeth set to and did just that. Of course, we see a reflection of the gospel here, but I think we also see a result of those hours in St. Petersburg discussing the works of Solovyov. Paul Valier has summarized Solovia's teaching on the sovereignty of love in this way. Loving people requires treating them justly. Just treatment requires respecting people's material needs. Over a period of years, the late 1920s and the early 30s, two ideas were developing. One was personal to Elizabeth, the other common to her and a group of friends. The group included Father Sergius Bulgakov, communist turned theologian, now teaching at the Institut Saint-Serge, and Elizabeth's mentor. Father Lev Gillet, widely known as an author with the pseudonym, a monk of the Eastern Church, and again, a notable figure in orthodoxy in Britain, and Nicholas Berdayev, the philosopher and theologian. 
They wanted a body separate from ACAR with an emphasis on social work with a firm theological foundation. This came to fruition in 1935 with the establishment of Orthodox Action. The idea was, the idea that was developing for Elizabeth Skoptseva was more than an idea. It was a calling, a compulsion. She needed a greater commitment, a fuller sacrifice. She was to become a nun. Some, Father Lever among them, tried to dissuade her, but her bishop, Metropon Evlogi, was supportive. Perhaps he did not fully grasp the direction her monasticism would take. And so, on the 7th of the March, 1932, Elizabeth was tonsured, taking the name Maria. Her saint was the penitent and ascetic St. Mary of Egypt. Mother Maria painted a dramatic, dramatic and very unconventional icon of St. Mary, which I will attempt to show you. How did the new nun understand the monastic calling? She began with an analogy. The liturgical texts for Great and Holy Saturday require dried figs and olives, which were not available in Russia. So pickled cabbage was substituted. Tradition is alive and adaptive in new circumstances, new things. So it was, it is, with monastic tradition. The high walls of the monastic enclosure, the lofty icon screens, the gilded gospel books are not available in the emigration. So monasticism must, light, but must fight for its very soul and disregarding all external forms, create new forms as it stands on the roads and crossroads of the world. The soul of monasticism is found in the vows made at tonsury, vows of chastity, obedience, and non-possession. Circumstances cannot change chastity. They have, however, changed obedience. In traditional monastic settings, obedience was total submission to the spiritual father, but that kind of submission is no longer possible. Spiritual fathers are few, scattered, and encumbered with too many tasks to give full attention to their disciples. Now, says Mother Maria, a monk should be obedient to the work of the church to which he, to which he is assigned. He should give his will and his creative powers entirely to this work. Obedience becomes service. When it comes to the third vow of non-possession, she declares that the ordinary emigre is essentially more of a non-possessor than the ordinary monk of the past. Remember, she's working among people who have lost their country, their status in an ordered society, however lowly that status was, and often their physical or mental health, and are now caught up in the effects of the depression. She sees two scriptural texts as key. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and greater love hath no man than to lay down his life for his friend. Non-possession is entirely contrary to any greed for spiritual riches, to the egocentrism that does good works to exercise its virtues. Along with St. Paul, a monastic should be ready to be cut off from Christ for the sake of others. He or she is to be a conduit for divine love, actively seeking the place to, to exercise the gifts God has given for this very purpose. Mother Maria has been called the rebel nun. This, I think, is not a totally accurate description. Certainly, Many of the pious were scandalized by her, 
her broken down boots, her shabby stained habit, the way in which she, she sat light to patterns of worship, all were disapproved of. And the company she kept, and she smoked. That last accusation should be viewed with caution. Elizabeth Bear Siegel, who as a young married woman knew M Mother Maria well, testifies that she never saw her smoke after she had been tonsured. As to the rest, Metropolitan Ed Logie tried to persuade her to be more like a traditional nun. He sent to other nuns to be her helpers, but there was a mutual failure to understand each other. After Father Lev moved away, there was a sequence of chaplains who tried to establish more formal ways of life, but again, there was a failure to see eye to eye until she found the perfect chaplain in Father Dmitri Klepanin. But was she a rebel or was she conforming to a different pattern? It is appropriate that today, the 2nd of August, we shall be spending time with Mother Maria, for this is a day she celebrated with special attention. It is the feast day of St. Basil, the fool for Christ. Mother Maria, with her disregard for convention, a deliberate refusal to conform to the wishes of the unco good, all served to link her with the pattern of folly for Christ. She herself wrote, personally, I believe that folly for Christ by its spectacular nature, its totally particular creativity moved towards the world and it is in the world that its direct activity is situated. And again, she says, this ascesis is definitely oriented towards the world. As a member of Orthodox Action, Mother Maria lived out her vocation oriented towards the world. She enumerated the work they had done, undertaken in a piece written in 1939, carefully not stressing her own role. At noisy le grand they established what was at first a sanatorium for emigres with tuberculosis, who were not included in government support schemes. Through the efforts of Orthodox Action, government policy was changed, so the sanatorium became a convalescent home. This was the longest lasting of their achievements, and Sofia Pilenko, Mother Maria's mother, spent her declining years there, dying in 1962, just short of her 100th birthday. Mother Maria herself converted a hen house into a chapel for the nuns, for the, for the house, sorry. Mother Maria visited mental hospitals where there were many emigres whose sanity had been destroyed by war and their experience as refugees. But there were others who were classified as insane through differences of language or cultural expectations between doctors and patients. She was able to secure the release of some 20 of these. Excuse me. Funding came from a variety of sources, some from the emigre community, some from the Church of England, some from the American YMCA, and some from the League of Nations. From all sources, it was possible to buy a small rundown property as an hostel for single women, among whom was Guyana, now at the Sorbonne. Father Lev lived in a room in the attic. Mother Maria slept in a space by the boiler, in the cinders, as she said. She also ran a soup kitchen, setting off early each morning to the vegetable market to get the best bargains she could. After two years, it became that larger premises were needed.
They were found at 77 Rue Lormel. Mother Maria rejoiced that her soup kitchen could now feed 100 people rather than the 25 in the old house. The house had been neglected for some time, but careful cleaning revealed many glories. What seemed to be concrete floors turned out to be expensive parquet. This time it was a stable that she converted into a chapel with icons, hangings and vestments made by Mother Maria. Among the embroideries is a tapestry of the life of David in the style of the Bayer tapestry. This is now preserved at the monastery of St. John the Baptist in Essex. Father Sergei wore one of the vestments at the liturgy celebrating the canonization of Mother Maria and her companions in 2004. The house no longer stands, but where it was, a small street has been built, the Rue Murray Skotsov. People came and the house was full, sometimes over full, so that Mother Maria gave up her own bed. At the common table, one might find young families, an escaping sex worker, ex-prisoners, people who were mentally or physically infirm. Mother cooked, she cleaned, she shopped, she listened, she was always available. As I, as I have already mentioned, she was given help, other monastics, who found the way of life to be too much for them. Their departure led to the foundation of the monastery at Bossi, so good came out of it. Eventually, the right chaplain was found in the form of Father Dmitri Klepinin with his wife and young daughter. Father Dmitri's teaching was very similar to that of Mother Maria. Love is undeniably the very content of life, for life was created by love. God is love. There is something worse than sin, a utilitarian love, a love for God and man without a love story. During this period, George returned to join his mother's helpers. Guyana married and returned with her husband to Soviet Russia. She found her mother remembered in literary circles and her poetry still read. In 1936 came news of her death. It was a consolation to her mother that, though not a great one, but to learn that she had died of typhus and at home, not caught up in the great terror. Also at this time, a new stream of refugees began to arrive not this time from Russia, but from Germany, fleeing the Nazis. The official policy of the French government was to turn, send refugees back over the Swiss border. Naturally, they came back. Only those could stay who had employment. Mother Maria's course of action for anyone who reached her at Rue Lormel was to register them with the authorities as being in her employment. This happened so often that officials told her that she would soon become the largest employer in Paris. Many of the refugees were Jewish. At first, they were just refugees. When the war came for a while, nothing changed for them. Rue Lormel became an official feeding center and there were government subsidies towards the cost of the soup kitchen, making life a little earlier, a little easier for Mother Maria. But the fall of France and the occupation of Paris brought with it the Gestapo and active persecution of Jews. Among the longtime Jewish residents of Paris was Elias von Dominsky. He was a close friend and collaborator of Mother Maria. Along with Father Bulgakov and Badaev, he gave lectures on the application of Christian principles to every life, everyday life, to a group which met at number 77. But he was not baptized, thinking he was not worthy. 
after Hitler declared war on Russia, a large number of Russians were rounded up and interned in a concentration camp at Compiègne. Elias was one of them. It was in the camp that he made the decision to be baptized. A makeshift Orthodox chapel had been created in the camp and there he was baptized and cremated. A plan was formed to struggle him out, to smuggle him out of the camp in, into the hospital and with the connivance of the hospital staff and through to Vichy France and then to America. He refused saying, I will live as a Christian and die as a Jew. And so it happened. He was sent to Auschwitz and there was murdered. Mother's, Mother Maria's concern was not just for one Jew, but, all, but for all she came across. Of course, she was moved by the gospel imperative and love of neighbor, by the example of the Good Samaritan. But I wonder if we have another influence from her study at Solovyov. Writing about what was known as the Jewish problem, he said there was no such thing. There was a Christian problem because Christians had behaved in such an unchristian way towards Jews. For a time, religious affiliation was taken into account in the definitions of Jewishness. So if you could prove that you were a Christian, this might help you to avoid persecution. Father Dimitri began to write certificates of baptism and add names to the parish roll. The certificates were marked with a special symbol that would enable them to be distinguished in future, but would be meaningless to the Gestapo. Some 80 names were added to the registers. Under pressure from the diocese, itself under pressure from the Gestapo, Father Dimitri insisted that the names of his spiritual children were confidential and could not be revealed. Others, not just Orthodox, acted in similar ways. The, the registers of the American Baptist Church show a large number of baptisms in this period. One can assume that those baptisms did not in fact take place. Rue Lormel became a temporary hiding place for Jews before they could be smuggled into Vichy, France. Then, on the night of the 15th, 16th July, 1942, there were mass arrests. Nearly 13,000 were rounded up, of whom 6,980, including 4,051 children, were interned in the Val d'Hiver, close to Rue Lormel. Conditions were atrocious. One water source, 10 latrines. Red Cross workers had access and Mother Maria was able to join them, providing what little aid or comfort was possible. There were rubbish collections and she had the idea to take advantage of this. With the help of the dustmen, a small number of children were smuggled out in dustbins to be helped on their way to Vichy. Perhaps someone had suspicions. Mother Maria was banned from the, from the stadium. After five days, all the remaining children were shipped out, first to the concentration camp at Drancy, and then, and then afterwards, eastwards, to the gas chambers. It was not long before that the adults followed them, not long after, that the adults followed them to Auschwitz. Very few survived. News of the impending arrests had leaked out, so that some took evasive action and sought refuge at Rue Lormel. Others managed to avoid arrest on the night. As a result, number 77 was crowded. People slept on all the floors in the house and in the outbuildings. Father Dimitri and George gave up their rooms to families. If the Gestapo come looking for Jews, said Mother Maria, I will take them to the chapel and show them the mother of God. They did come, but only George was at home. He was arrested with a message left that if Mother Maria and Father Dimitri attended the Gestapo offices next day, 
it would be set free. Mother Marie was not in Paris visiting Daniel Skopsov at the small holding. So Father Dimitri was the first to attend. He was interrogated for four hours. During the course of the interrogation, he was offered his freedom if he would stop helping Jews. As a response, he held up his pectoral cross and showed the figure on it to the interrogator. Do you know this Jew? He asked and was knocked to the floor. This was reported by the interrogator himself on a boasting visit to number 77. Your priest did for himself, he crowed. Mother Maria arrived, accompanied by her mother. There was a similar process. The interrogator shouted at Sophia Pilenko, you brought your daughter up badly. All she can do is help Yitz. Sophia replied, my daughter is a genuine Christian and for her there is neither Greek nor Jew, only individuals in distress. If you were threatened by some disaster, she would help you too. Her daughter responded, yes, I suppose I would. The inevitable outcome was imprisonment. Mother Maria was sent to a tour women's prison, George and Father Dimitri to Compiègne. In a letter to Rulormel, Mother Maria wrote that she was better off than they were with meals and regular exercise. Compiègne too was a place of some consolation. A chapel had been fashioned out of a dining hall and George wrote of the daily liturgies and receiving communion. Father Dimitri continued to prepare him for ordination to the priesthood. There is a question about how far he was along that road. The canonization document describes him as a reader, but in the icons I mentioned earlier, he is vested as a subdeacon. In transit to Germany, the women spent a night in an old barracks next to the camp which held the men. George mingled with the catering staff as they left and managed to make contact with his mother. They talked through the night until George returned as he had left. From Compiègne, he and Father Dimitri were transferred to Buchenwald and from there to Dora. This was a labor camp, totally underground, constructing the launching site and the factories for the bombs, the V-bombs, to be directed at England. Life expectancy was short. Within 10 days of his arrival on the 25th of January, 1945, George was covered in boils. He was placed in the so-called hospital, which had no medical equipment or medicines. And on about 6th of January, he was sent to an unknown destination for what was described as medical treatment, that is, to be murdered. Two days later, Father Dimitri arrived in the hospital, dying of pneumonia. On 10th of February, his body was sent to Buchenwald for, for cremation. Mother Maria was transferred to Ravensbrück. The literature of the concentration camps is extensive and well known, so there's no need to elaborate on the conditions which she endured there. She was probably better foot fitted to survive than many of her fellow prisoners. The years spent as a refugee, her work in Paris, especially the hostels, her asceticism, all meant that she was used to the lack of privacy, poor diet, and physical effort. She was acquainted with death within her family during the revolution and the civil war among the emigres in Paris. Funerals for the destitute were at one time celebrated almost daily in the chapel at Lormel. Above all, she had the strength of her inner life, which enabled her to see beyond the desolation and degradation around her. Evil, she believed, is ephemeral. Beyond the confines of this life, there is no such thing. Eternal evil cannot exist. 
death, she believed, to be birth into eternity, and torments, including those at Ravensbrook, to be birth pangs. It was all part of her self-offering. Towards the end, she asked a fellow prisoner to memorize a message, and if it became possible, to give it to Metropolitan Evlogy, Father Bolgarkov, and her mother. My state at present is such that I completely accept suffering in the knowledge that this is how things ought to be for me and how I am to die. I see in this a blessing from on high. Mother's creativity did not desert her while she was in Ravens' book. She composed poems, found writing materials to record them, but sadly they did not survive. She found a piece of charcoal and used it to draw an image of Christ on the cross, crowned with thorns. Efforts were made to preserve it, and for a time it was kept hidden during searches. Unfortunately, during a sudden and unexpected search, it was found, taken away and never seen again. When news of the Normandy landings reached the prisoners, Mother Maria began to embroider another tapestry in commemoration. Using thread, she was able to preserve from her work in the sewing workshop, insulation from electric flexes, and a needle, a stolen needle. She ma made her tapestry. As well as the Bayer Star pictures, there is a text. Then they came, the Norsemen, the lofty fortress they besieged, and within their, their arms befell the rich booty. Fiercely they fought, the brave invaders, for the filthy devils were doomed to death. Meanwhile rejoiced the peaceful folk. These words, known to one of her fellow prisoners, were scratched on the ground during one of the interminable roll calls by the person for whom Mother Maria was making the work. She committed them to memory, and so they are preserved until this day. Mother Maria created another icon while in the camp, an icon of the Mother of God holding a crucified Christ child. I am not clear as to whether it was embroidered or drawn. The original is lost. A sketch exists, drawn by Sister Joanna Reitlinger, a spiritual child of Father Bulgarkov, and later of Father Alexander Men, and a friend of Mother Maria in Paris. Did she see the original, or did someone describe it to her? Based on her sketch, an icon was painted by Sophia Rajevsky Ostop. Perhaps one of you can clarify the matter. It's known as the Mother of God of Raven's book. An icon of the Mother of God holding the crucified Christ child points us to Mother Maria's understanding of the Mother of God as the Mother of the Crucified One. She conflates the words of Simeon at the meeting, a sword will pass through your own soul also, also, with the words of the letter to the Hebrews, the word of God is a living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. She records herself that she visited a military cemetery and saw crosses which turned into swords on each gravestone, and this influenced her thinking. It is a two-edged sword which pierces the soul of Christ's mother. She suffers because he suffers. As she saw her, sorry, as she saw her standing at the foot of the cross, Mother Maria would surely have understood that her own pain at the bedside of Anastasia was like that of the mother of God. But the mother of God had felt this pain from the beginning, 
forewarned by Simeon. As she saw him despised and rejected, she felt his pain, and in that sense was a co-sufferer. But the sword has a double edge. The mother of God is also our mother, gifted to the church from the cross. So she also feels our sufferings. The emaciated mother of God in the icon suffers with those at Rafa's book. She is a co-sufferer. This has implications for our attitudes to those in need or pain of any kind. We can, of course, help them because it is commanded that we do so. We can help them because doing good works is good for our souls, but aids our spiritual development. Mother Maria has no time for such attitudes. They go against her belief in non-possession, of self-emptying. She draws on the concept of Sobhanaya, of community. Their need is our need. We do not give charity, help those who suffer out of superiority, but as co-sufferers. We do not give bread under the act, unless the action means something about the recipient as a person, unless we are partaking in community with them. Mother Maria did give bread. She was prepared to share her meager ration of bread and afterwards and towards the end, gave it all away. On the rare occasions when food parcels arrived, each parcel was divided among a self-selected group. Mother would frequently share her portion with a person outside the group. She shared the gospel right from the beginning in the quarantine camp and continuing in the camp proper. She began discussion circles with about all kinds of topics. One participant says, These discussions, whatever the subject matter, provided an escape from the hell in which we lived. Someone had managed to retain a book with gospel passages and Mother Maria would read these and the group would comment and meditate on them. Another prisoner notes that although she prayed with believers and read the gospel, she never preached to outsiders, but discussed religion simply with those who sought it causing them to understand it and exercise their minds, not merely their feelings. We remember St. Peter's advice, always be prepared to make a defense, prosopologian, to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Above all, she shared herself. She was on good terms with everyone. She was the kind of person who made no distinction between people. She got on well with the young and the elderly, with those who had extremely progressive political views and those whose religious beliefs differed radically from her own. She allowed nothing of secondary importance to impede her contact with people. We are reminded of that salon in St. Petersburg. She had a special effect on the younger prisoners. One said that she took us under her wing and somehow she provided us with a family. One of the blocks in the camp held prisoners from Soviet Russia. They would seek out Mother Maria and would go off radiant, as someone said. The constant in camp life was the smoke from the crematorium, the first thing prisoners saw each day. Mother Maria said of this, it is only here, immediately above the chimneys, that the billows of smoke are oppressive. But when they rise higher, they turn into light clouds before being dispersed altogether in limitless space. In the same way, our souls, once they have torn themselves away from this sinful earth, move by means of an effortless, unearthly flight 
into eternity where there is life full of joy. Early in 1945, Mother Maria's strength was failing. Her legs would not support her properly. Others supported her at the daily counts. Even the blockover, Christina, not apparently noted for her sweetness of disposition, joined in shielding her, even hiding her from searches. She had already been selected once for transfer to the youth camp, a smaller camp nearby, where conditions were worse and rations smaller. It was designed to kill. Contrary to all previous experience, part of the group were returned to the main camp. Selections continued even and even increased. Did Mother Maria take another woman's place in a selection on the 30th of March, 1945? Or was she included in the selection anyway? There was another selection in the youth camp the next day, Western Holy Saturday. Was it then that she took another's place? Eyewitnesses accounts differ. What is certain is that Mother Maria entered the gas chamber that day because of who she was as the logical end of a life, lived as a sacrifice of love to Christ and her neighbor. Faith, working through love. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ian, for that. Um, it was a wonderful, detailed account of her life and work um, and St. Maria is such an interesting character and we have um, already a couple of questions but just a reminder that um, if you'd like to ask a question please do type it into the um, uh, into the chat function. Um, I'm just going to try and stop the um, screen share. Um, not sure I can. Let's see no, if no. I can close the document. Uh, no, no. Okay. Uh, well, I'll go back to um, gallery view. Yes, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Subdeacon Ian. Um, so I've uh, got um, a question already. So let me just get that up. Um, we had a comment as well um, from Regina to see, uh, to say what an amazing change of life um, St. Saint Maria went through, um, and I think on multiple occasions um, that she went through such an, uh, such a significant change in her life, um, and it is fascinating to see that. But we have a specific question from um, Reverend Patrick, who um, mentions um, St. Maria's poetry and a very specific quotation, which I will read out for everyone. But what can human malice mean to thee, who have heard the thunder from Sinai? And he suggests that um, that perhaps her appreciation of Judaism went beyond um, love of neighbor and beyond humanitarianism. Um, and uh, was this developed in her writing um, or perhaps was it just shown in how she um, interacted with Jewish people? Um, basically, um, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I haven't read everything that she's written. Um, I would love to have done that. I hope I'll read more as the years go by. So, uh, but it's an interesting comment, an interesting question. Yes, yes absolutely. Um, thank you um, for that. Um, I wondered, um, well, would you like to comment on, on what Regina was saying about um, you know, the real transformational um, changes that she had in her life and <clears throat> perhaps particularly with the death of her daughter, which led to so much. Do you think that um, uh, perhaps what she had gone through in her life up to that point was the significant moment or was it really the, the death of her daughter, which um, was the main catalyst for that change? I think probably it was, was 
might have been a mixture of the the death the actual death and the time leading up to it mm. by the bedside when she would have had time to review her past life and um, as she said in the the quotation i put up she'd been wandering down byways uh, and now she saw a new path and um, certainly that was a a total radical change mm. uh, and um i i suppose one of the other things which is so striking about her is is how um and you sort of mentioned um the the kind of views of her which people had when she became a nun um and whether or not she did smoke when she was actually a nun you know these these sort of um characteristics and personal traits which um really unite her to modern uh, modern people um, so the fact that she had been married and and in fact got divorced um, that she became a nun after all of these things had happened I think is very interesting for people to think about in 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 the modern context and that's one of the reasons I think why um, it was um, suggested that we we have Saint Maria as one of our um, uh, examples during this series but I wondered if you wanted to comment on on the sort of lessons that we can draw from her life and her work um, in that uh, sort of comparative sense. Hmm. Yes well can I go back to the uh, quotation right at the beginning from Pobeda Notzer about um, loving the one who is near rather than the one mm. who is far away uh, because nowadays the, the one who is far away is actually in our drawing room on the um, the idiot's lantern and um, the, the television uh, and in the news um, and that's a we then face with this question for all of us what does love tell me to do in this situation mm. um, and um, I think it's particularly important um, closer to home in that British society appears to be becoming more and more antagonistic um, and love for the one who is next to you <laughs> is, is sometimes uh, not what it might be. Uh, so I think it's we all have our individual vocation and we attempt to love as our situation and our vocation points us. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes, I think so. I think um, the sort of the question of who is our neighbour is is one we continue to ask ourselves, particularly in the, the modern context, isn't it? And, and I think um, what's so striking about Saint Maria is that, as you said, you know, she she really treated those people who she met every day with very difficult problems, whether it was mental health issues, um, uh, uh, the you know, those who have been um, enslaved in, in sex working or those who have um, nothing to their name or those who are being persecuted under uh, by the Gestapo. I think it was literally everyone who she came across. Um, and I think that's, I suppose, a way for us to think, well, who is our neighbour? It's mm. literally yeah, everyone who, who we meet in that context. Mm. Um, Regina has asked, how can we follow such a model now? I mean, she, she introduced such a, uh, an interesting way, uh, uh, form of monasticism, but of course that's not necessarily the, the, um, uh, the, for everyone to follow. How, how can we take her example forward? It's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes, don't all go off and knock at the door at twelves and nights and say, can I come in and stay? Um, you, 
you are you in your situation. You are you with your vocation. God says to you, or he nudges you, or hmm. someone else nudges you on his behalf. Um, I don't think there's one single answer. Yes. Um, I, I think that's very true. Um, I think perhaps um, Nina, Nina has just uh, made a comment um, talking about neighbours who are near us or far away. Um, those who are who may be next to us in person may also be far away if they are wedded to their IT or their phones <laughs> and the present zeitgeist. So yes, there can be people who are near but yet far away. Um, I I wondered whether you had any thoughts about um, uh, Saint Maria's sort of creativity um, and the fact that she was, um, you know, in addition to all her practical work that she was. Um, a creative person and, and writes about beauty and um, she wrote poetry and she embroidered and um, many sort of practical expressions mm. of creativity. I wondered whether you had any thoughts about uh, what that can tell us about how she then responds uh, uh, to other people and in her work. Oh, I am not as knowledgeable about her uh, arts um, mm. as um, one would like to be. Um, I can tell you uh, some printed sources that will put you in touch with it. Um, but I suppose, um, sort of groping furiously, um, Creativity um, is, our creativity can be in the relationships which we form with people. Um, and yes, we um, can learn, we can try to learn to, to respond to God's creation in ways that are different. Um, I think the more you pray, the more you see beauty. Um, and seeing beauty perhaps encourages you to create beauty. Don't know. I'm not. I'm not a very creative person. Um, <laughs> not a creative person at all. Um, no practical sense at all, as my wife would tell you. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think something along those lines would. Yeah. Yes, and I think um, fr from my perspective, I find it really significant that she continued to create while in those incredibly yeah, those difficult circumstances. circumstances. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. And whether it was scratching words on the floor and then committing them to memory or creating embroideries out of, you know, the insulating wire and so on. I think that I, you know, persisting in creating mm. um, beautiful things to the glory of God, of course, um, in those circumstances is significant. Um, yes, we've had a couple of other questions. Um, please do put them in the chat if you have got them. Um, we'll we'll try and go on for about five more minutes. So um, Nina has um, said about um, or talking about the craft um, area still. So um, using our hands in crafting and other art forms as um, a, a form of praise and co-creation with God. And of course, there is a very much an element of inspiration and and prayer certainly in the creation of liturgical art in, in icons and so on. So that's more of a comment. Um, Father Julian has also asked, um, the remark, um, being a fool turned to the world, reflects perhaps that we all carry our individual cross in this world, whether we're aware of it or not, a fool turned to the world. Would you agree with, with how that is sort of reflected in in what um, St. Maria says about folly for Christ and um, that we have these sort of individual ways of um, uh, carrying our crosses. Uh, yes, I'm not quite sure that 
um, everybody could qualify as a fool for Christ just because they're carrying their own particular cross. Um, because that's something for all of us. And being a fool for Christ is a particular and special vocation. Um, and uh, It's interesting that she's not titled fool for Christ, of course, that um, uh, it's her martyrdom really yes that is, is the significant um yeah thing for her but it is interesting isn't it how how many facets of almost of different types of sainthood that she displays so monastic martyr um creator of beautiful um things um as well as possibly fall for christ yes mm. yeah uh, yes, we've got another one, a long one coming, so I, I, might, ha I might have to um, uh, slightly summarise. So um, have you seen any evidence of influence from some of the ecumenical movement? You mentioned, for example, the YMCA, the SCM. I forget what SCM stands for, but... Um, Student Christian Movement. Thank you. <laughs> um, and the Fellowship of St. Auburn and St. Sergius and so on. Um, and her identification of diaconia or service as itself the mission of the church um, which is also reflected in um, writers of the same time Dietrich Bonhoeffer and others so there are across the the ecumenical and Christian spectrum there are people talking about this service and um, do you think there was kind of influence on um, Saint Maria by these other writers and by these people, or was was she really working within um, her very practical um, treatment of individuals and what she what she encountered day to day? Yeah, well, I, I doubt very much whether she would have known about Bonhoeffer, mm. um, but um, Father Sergius Bulgakov, who was her mentor, her father confessor, uh, was certainly involved in ecumenical work um, and so I suppose she would have known about it from him and been at least favorably disposed um, and of course the um, American YMCA money that's um, not a notably orthodox source um, yeah I probably um, again, one have to devel, de, delve further into her writings. Um, there, there, there was uh, influence from a wider um, ecclesiastical thing, but um, she had her road to travel and she travelled mm. it. Yes, I, I think that's very interesting. And I think um, the Women's Ministries Initiative held a study day on St. Maria um, uh, I suppose it's almost two years ago now um, in Oxford and you know people really are studying her writings and her um, artistic work as well um, so I think there will be further um, not discoveries that's not the right way but for, for, uh, to express it but um, yeah. further um, explanation yeah. and a deeper consideration of, of what she really represents so yeah. I hope sure. um, uh, that will you know continue to to grow in terms of the academic yeah. considerations yeah well, um, i'm sure that i expected that people who had been to elena's study day would be rushing to correct me because <laughs> <laughs> they'll all know much more than i do well i wondered whether um perhaps as as our final question um i could ask you um why you uh wanted to speak or um uh, were willing to speak about saint maria what what has her um connection with you been like in your orthodox life um well as i say i first discovered her long before i was orthodox um and tw on two occasions um one um, in the bookshop at the Saint Serge Institute in Paris, there was a book, a biography of Mother Maria, and I felt I must buy this. Um, 
and then I'm not sure whether it was before or after, and the in the bookshop at the monastery in Essex, um, there was a book of her writings, and again, I must buy this. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, as I said at the beginning, she has um, drawn me to herself, and uh, I hope to um, follow her a bit more. <laughs> yeah. Did that answer your question? Very much. Thank you. Um, Subdeacon Ian, I am so grateful and would like to thank you on everyone's behalf. There have been several messages of thanks in the chat, um, uh, you know, finding out more about St. Maria and um, thank you for such an interesting talk. Uh, We really are very grateful. Um, For those who maybe missed the very beginning, just to let you know, this session has been recorded and we will make it available on the YouTube channel of the fellowship um, in due course. Um, I have also put into the chat a link if you would like to make a small donation to the fellowship for this summer series of talks um, and uh, uh, that will go towards our in-person conference next year and hopefully reduce the cost um, for participants. Thank you once again Subdeacon Ian, I'm really um, very grateful, Um, I love St Maria and um, I'm very blessed that in our parish we have a beautiful icon of her and some of the images from her life and uh, I hope that everyone who participated has learned something um, about her and perhaps will be inspired to go away and learn more. There are several wonderful books of uh, her life as you mentioned by Father Sergei Hackel um, but also um, several people have written about her and collected some of her writings So do go and seek those out. Um, Thank you all. Our next session will be next Monday and will be about uh, Metropolitan Anthony of Surosh. And uh, I think it will be a wonderful continuation of our series. I hope you can join us then. Um, And uh, in our traditional way, we will close this session by encouraging you to go to gallery view if you can, turn on your camera if you would like to, Um, And then we can all wave at each other. And so we are not together in person, but we are all together in spirit and hopefully joined by St. Maria um, today. So good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. It's been lovely to see you all. Um, Thank you again and hope to see you next time. Bye Bye for now.